Hello, and welcome back for another Torah Tuesday. Today we're in Leviticus chapter 25. This speech, like the rest of Leviticus, is set at Mount Sinai, and it explicitly says that at the beginning of the chapter, but it anticipates Israel's future in the land of Canaan and regulates sacred time in relation to land. So we have already looked at Leviticus chapter 23, which also introduced sacred time, and it regulated the yearly calendar by showing what the festivals are that the Israelites are supposed to celebrate that punctuate each year. Leviticus 25 is slightly different because it regulates longer cycles of time, sets of years. Since every yearly festival was related to the Sabbath and happened in cycles of seven or patterns of seven, it should come as no surprise that these longer periods of time are also sets of seven. So first, we are introduced to the Sabbath year. Every seven years, the Israelites are to celebrate a Sabbath year by giving their land a year to rest and not be plowed and harvested. So there's a Sabbath year every seven years, and every seven Sabbath years, there's a year of Jubilee, which is an additional year of Sabbath rest, and it's like a giant reset button for the entire land of Israel, where every plot of land reverts back to its original owner. So here are some of the key concepts that we see in Leviticus 25. First of all, verse 23 says this, The land must not be sold permanently, because the land is mine, and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. Property sales are always temporary land use contracts, because the land doesn't belong to any person, it belongs to Yahweh. These temporary use contracts take into consideration how many years remain before the year of Jubilee. So it's basically a rental agreement depending on how many years remain until the year of Jubilee. The other thing we see in this verse 23 is that the people's status as guests on God's land is meant to radically transform how they treat other people. Because they are guests on the land, they are to treat everyone else as guests as well. Now, there's a section toward the end of this chapter that may seem troubling. So if you're reading Leviticus 25 and you begin reading in verse 24, you find that the Israelites are apparently allowed to have slaves, foreign slaves. So these rules about foreign slaves may seem troubling, but they're likely here in this chapter on land use because foreigners will never be able to own land in Israel. They will never be able to have their own family estate that they can pass on from generation to generation. They will always be visitors. And so the Israelites are allowed to permanently hire a servant who's a foreigner, and that servant can stay from generation to generation in the same family. When the Israelites come into the land, God designates for each tribe, a certain amount of land, a certain area in which they're going to live. And so there will never be land available for any other nations within the land of Israel. I think this is a big reason why we see these laws regulating the hiring of foreign slaves or foreign servants. But this is another thing we need to remember. We're only seeing a piece of the puzzle here. If we want to see how these servants are to be treated, we need to read the rest of the Torah. And there are lots and lots of guardrails in place in the instructions at Sinai that ensure that a servant will never be able to be exploited the way the people of Israel were exploited in Egypt. So you can just read, if you want uh, to explore this on your own, read Exodus 20 through 23, the Book of the Covenant. These are the the laws given at Sinai when, when Moses first gets the Ten Commandments. And those laws set up lots of of checks and balances to make sure that no one's being exploited. People can't be bought or sold. They can't be um, taken advantage of if they're widows or orphans. They're supposed to be well treated. In many ways, they're supposed to have Sabbath rest along with everyone else in the household. So there are lots of guardrails in place to make sure that exploitation is not happening. So I think that's important to note in this chapter. If you want more on slavery laws in the Old Testament, I have an online lecture that I gave with a 
uh, Q&A time at the end, and I will put a link to that in the description below this video in case you want more on that. But for now, I hope you have a great week, and I hope this is getting you thinking about sacred time and sacred space and God's desire for his people to orient their entire lives in patterns that celebrate his creative work and that celebrate his work of redemption that in which we can rest. Every seven days we get a chance to rest and remember what God has done on our behalf and the gifts that he has given us. I think it also is worth thinking about the way that we too are just guests on this earth. Nothing truly belongs to us. Everything is on loan to us from God. And so therefore, we can be generous with what he's loaned to us, knowing that everything we have comes from him in the first place. Have a great week.